thank you so much for being here. We're so excited to learn with you today. Rabbi, Nathan, Rabbi Dr. Nathan Lopez Cardozo is one of my greatest teachers. Uh, in my years studying in Israel, I had the chance to learn with him uh, consistently. And um, and then in, in the two decades since then, I've continued to stay in touch and learn with him from a distance. You're definitely in for a treat today for, with one of the great theologians and Jewish thinkers of our time. Really a uh, very forward-looking thinker uh, who's at the center of many, many pressing issues. And uh, we're excited to partner today with BMHBJ. And for the formal intro, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Rabbi Yaakov Chaitavsky in Denver. Uh, thank you very much, Rav Shmuley. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Pleasure for us to welcome our esteemed presenter today, Rabbi Dr. Nathan Lopez Cardozo, who's the founder and dean of the David Cardozo Academy and the Beit Midrash of Avraham Avinu in the holy city of Jerusalem. Uh, he is an amazingly broad-minded thinker, sought-after lecturer on the international stage for Jewish and non-Jewish audiences, the author of 13 books, numerous articles in English and Hebrew, uh, and he heads a think tank and all I'm going to say is that we are uh, lucky to have, really, and I say this as a very great compliment, one of our time's um, great thinking rabbis. We have a lot of rabbis. We have a lot of thinkers. We don't have a lot of great thinking rabbis. And Rabbi Nathan Cardozo is indeed a thinking rabbi. Please give him your undivided attention. Good evening and good morning. I'm in the evening, you are in the morning. I'm in Herzliya at this moment in Israel, where I live. And thank you very much, Rabbi Shmulevich, uh, Shmuli, and also Rabbi Chaitovsky, right? Am I right about this? Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, I promised to speak about the Holocaust. This is a topic which obviously is always on the mind from, of many people. And it is an extremely difficult, complicated topic. And people obviously ask, what is the religious attitude towards this particular very difficult moment in Jewish life? I will start by telling you about something which happened several weeks ago in the city where I live, where a professor of physics, a good friend of mine, said in a lecture about the Holocaust that as far as he is concerned, the Holocaust is a reflection of the kulalot, of the different curses which are mentioned in the Torah and especially in Kitavo, in Parashat Kitavo, where, as I'm sure you know, uh, we read there about the terrible thing which happened to the Jewish people in case they don't listen to the Torah and to the word of God. And he said, after all, this is the reason why the Holocaust happened. Loads of Jews had moved away from the Jewish tradition. Most Jews did not anymore want to be really part of that. And therefore, this happened to our parents, grandparents. Um, he went on to say that um, he knows about a rabbi, a Dutch rabbi, I'm from Holland and he is also from Holland, from the Netherlands, who became religious because of that reason. It was a rabbi who came from a completely secular background. And once he had read all the kalolot, all, all the different curses uh, in the Torah of what will happen to us, uh, he decided that he better becomes religious because it is as clear as it can be that if you read the kalalot, when you read the curses, and especially when you read the midrashim, and there are many of them, you get a complete insight into why the Holocaust happened. And therefore, there is only one thing what he could do, and that is to go and do Teshuvah. So he did, and actually he became a, quite a big Talmud Chacham. He's now probably about 80 years old. And um, this, at the time when the professor of physics made this point, many people got terribly upset. 
Among them were many Nitzule Shoah, people who had survived the Holocaust and uh, were not religious. Some of them were religious. And they said, this is completely unacceptable. We don't believe that. And he upset loads of people at the time. I was sitting in the audience, but it was very difficult at that moment to respond. And I only did that later on. And um, I should start by saying that personally, I also come from a secular background, a completely secular background, a Spinoza background for those who know who Spinoza was, and uh, also believe that the Holocaust was actually a proof that God does not exist, because a God would never have permitted something like that. Therefore, I belong to the group which calls themselves call themselves atheists, and I was actually quite proud about that. But then I heard one day that in Amsterdam, I was born in Amsterdam, there was a woman, a Jewish woman, who had become religious, Jewishly religious, after the Holocaust. And I wondered how that could be, specifically because I knew that she had been in the camps, in the Machanot, in the different Holocaust camps, Auschwitz, Birkenau, and other camps. How can anybody become religious after such an experience? So what did I do? I was about 16, 17 years old. I went to see her and I told her my opinion. And she looked to me and she said the following words, which made me to shiver. She said, young man, you are not permitted to use the Holocaust for denying God. So I said, why not? She said, because I, not you, but I, I was in the Holocaust. I was in Auschwitz. I was in Birkenau. I was in Bergen-Belsen. She went to several Machanot. And I can tell you what happened to me over there was such incredible miracle that I was able to survive under the most impossible circumstances that I felt my hand on my back every time when I nearly was dead and killed even in the, in the gas chambers. And she said, when I came out of the Holocaust, I said to myself, it is so clear that there is a God that I better serve him. And therefore I became Dati, I became a religious person. That shocked me completely. And it destroyed my attitude. Why? First of all, I have not been there. I was born in 46. Secondly, if a woman like that tells me this and says to me, you are not allowed, ethically allowed, to deny God's existence on the basis of the Holocaust, then I tell you the reason is because I know that God is there. I felt him. He was with me at the time. True. I don't know why that happened to so many other millions of people, but that doesn't take away from my experience. This was a shock. And indeed, since that moment, I also started to look into uh, religious Judaism. And ultimately, I became, I don't know if that's the right word, but a Baal Teshuvah. Um, I remember that Eli Wiesel once said, the Jewish tradition has its silences, but we do not speak about them which is quite a remarkable observation. What he meant to say was, um, A.D. Wiesel was known for this. He kept on believing in God, also he him, as a child was himself in the concentration camps. But he said that whatever may be the case, I will hold on to my emuna, even though I have many questions to ask on which I do not have any answer. And this indeed, all these statements were the ones which made me to think twice about this whole issue, and I looked into it. Indeed, some people have told me, it is the same question which you can ask about a child who has died. Also, that is incomprehensible. Also, that cannot be understood. And therefore, the question is as strong with the child as it is with the Holocaust. I didn't agree with that, and I don't agree with that, not because it is a terrible thing when a child dies, but because in the Jewish tradition, and also Jewish philosophers have made that point, 
uh, there is something which we call a covenant, a breed between God on one side and the Jewish people on the other side. And there's a mutual agreement that each one will look after the other. The Jewish people will look after God in the sense that um, they will keep the mitzvot, they will observe the commandments, and God then will also look after them, making sure that they would never get destroyed. In other words, it is a covenant, it's not a, just a matter of a child, which is a point which needs to be made. A covenant, after all, is a mutual agreement. And that agreement was on one side, so people say, was on one side violated by the Jews, but on the other side, it was violated by God because he did not look after the Jews in the Holocaust. Six million people got killed, better murdered in a most terrible way. And if you think about the fact that there were one million children involved in this who also got murdered in a most terrible way, then you get the picture. Anyway, I looked into this and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what authors have been written about this. And I will also tell you what my personal opinion in this matter is. You may know that there was a very famous rabbi I learned under his uh, Talmidim, under his students uh, many years uh, before, uh, by the name of Rabbi Elchanan Wasserman. Elchanan Wasserman was the Talmud Mufak, the special student of the Chafetz Chaim. And he, in several of his books and essays, he said that the reason why the Holocaust took place is exactly what my friend, the professor of physics said, and that is assimilation as one point. Secondly, German culture, which influenced the German Jews tremendously, and the violation of Jewish law altogether. That was widespread at the time, and therefore, this is what happened to us. There was another very great rabbi, with whom I do not agree, but it was a great rabbi. He was called the Satmer Rebbe. He was called uh, Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum, who wrote some very profound works also on the Holocaust, in which he maintained that the reason why the Holocaust happened, believe it or not, was Zionism. Zionism, secular Zionism, ultimately led to the Holocaust. Why? Here it is. Because the Jews were not permitted to go back to the land of Israel unless God would take them there. I'm sure you have heard this argument before. And since Zionism went on its own, didn't care about God, did not care about the mitzvot, Therefore, they violated a basic tenets ten within the Jewish community, or better, within the Jewish tradition. And that's the reason why the Holocaust happened. And also, a person who said something similar to that, not identical, but similar to that, was the famous Rabbi Yitzhak Hutner, who was one of the great Rosh Hashivot in, uh, in America, who also wrote about the fact that it was because of assimilation that all this happened. He had a very different way of looking to that, but it came down to the same principle. I must tell you that you find the same principle also with Karl Barth. Karl Barth is one of the great Protestant uh, Christian thinkers who also said that the Jews, and he was definitely not anti-Semitic, that the Jews were punished for the fact that they did not live in according to the Torah, and obviously that they did not uh, accept Jesus as the Mashiach, as the Messiah. But there was another person, to my great surprise, by the name of Rabbi Shlomo Tachtal. Rabbi Shlomo Tachtal was originally also a Satmar Hasid, a follower of the Satmar Rebbe. But in the middle of the Holocaust, he decided to change his mind 180 degrees and said that the reason, a very interesting book, the very reason why the Holocaust happened is because we were not Zionists. Because when we had an opportunity to go back to Israel in earlier days, before the state of Israel was established, uh, we did not do so. We kept 
ourselves and we stayed within Europe and therefore it happened. So here you get a very interesting paradox. On one side, several rabbis tell us that the reason is Zionism, secular Zionism. That's the reason why the Holocaust has happened. And on the other side, there is somebody like Rabbi Shlomo Tachtal who makes exactly the first point, and that is to say the reason why we had this terrible experience is because we did not go back to Israel. We stayed in Galut, and that is, and for this reason, it is what happened to become true. So what do you have over here? A contradiction in terms. One is saying Zionism, the other one saying not Zionism is all that what is all about. But they all agreed basically on the fact that the lack of Shemirat Mitzvot, observance of the Torah, was the ultimate reason why all this happened. You can see it from a Zionist perspective, it can, you can see it from an anti-Zionist perspective, but the truth about it is that that is what took place. Then came a third very important rabbi who influenced me greatly and lived later, but also found himself in the Holocaust. And that was the famous professor Rabbi Eliezer Berkowitz. Rabbi Eliezer Berkowitz is a very profound thinker. And he said, I am not prepared to accept any of these explanations. Why? Because I consider that to be a Hilul Hashem, the desecration of God's name, for the following reason. If you believe that God punished the Jewish people by way of a Holocaust, the cruelty is unimaginable. We never will comprehend that then you are giving God such a bad name that it becomes a Chilul Hashem, and I am absolutely not prepared to go along with that. One million children get killed, and you tell me afterwards that that is justified because God did so? That was the question which Rabbi Berkowitz asked. So here was an other opinion still which I was confronted with. Rabbi Berkowitz said and wrote in a, in a very famous work of his called Face After the Holocaust, where he writes that he believes that it was all in the hand of man that the Holocaust happened. There were evil people like Hitler in Marshall and the whole Nazi regime who out of their own free will decided on destroying the Jewish people and so many other people. And it is man who is the one who is responsible, and it is not God. God gave us freedom of will, you know the argument, and man can decide what to do with that freedom of will, to the good or to the bad. Here it went to the bad, and therefore don't start to try to say that God brought this about. When I saw that, I was again shocked, because that was again a very different opinion. But I couldn't make complete peace with it. Why? Because why should God not be able to stop the Holocaust in the middle when Hitler started to do these terrible things? He could have said, that's too much and I will interfere. He could have destroyed the Mahanot, the concentration camps. He could have done so many other things and it did not happen. The Jews cried out to him and there was no response, except for people like the woman I just mentioned before. But all that obviously became quite problematic. Rabbi Berkowitz continued to say that the greatest proof for God's existence is the establishment of the state of Israel. That was so unbelievable and beyond comprehension as well in the positive sense of the word. 1948, the, the, the state of Israel is being established against all the laws of history against all that what we normally consider to be normal, that he said, that is the proof that God exists after all. I don't know why the Holocaust happened, but I do know that without the God, the state of Israel could never have been established. That was the opinion of Rabbi Berkowitz. Medinat Israel, in other words, was the very hand which God showed into history to show the Jews that he was there after all, and that things would get better. Well, 
that is definitely also an interesting opinion. And then there is still an also opinion, and that is the one of our dear friend, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg. Rabbi Yitz Greenberg has written about the Holocaust as well. And he made a very interesting point. I've been told, but I did not hear that from him, that he has come back on this point of view. But it is an interesting one to mention. He did not discuss why the Holocaust happened. He only said one thing. After what happened, the Jews are no longer obligated to live in according to the Torah. Why? Because God had violated his own covenant with the Jewish people. It can't be that God must have done that for whatever reason. It is beyond me. But I do believe he said, I hope that I uh, uh, quote him correctly, that since that moment, the Jews are no longer obligated, but they should definitely live in according to the Torah, but out of their own free will, not because anybody told him, told him or told them anything like that. The covenant is over. As I told you, I've heard once more that Rabbi Greenberg came back on this. I'm not exactly sh sure why that is, but I do like something about it, although I don't like it at the same time. Rabbi Greenberg basically makes the point that for God to violate our covenant with him in such a terrible way, automatically also uh, makes it impossible for Jews still to feel that they're obligated. Because the obligation is or on both sides, or on no side. Interesting point. I remind you of the fact that on Purim, in a few, in another one and a half week, uh, we hear in the Gemara about a case where the Jews uh, were forced into uh, observing the Torah, and that there was a question being asked by one of the rabbis, one of the sages in the Talmud, which asked the question, how can that be that God forced them into it? That's also not a covenant. If you don't come out of freedom of will to the covenant and accept it, but you're forced into it. Remember, the Talmud tells us that God said to them, in case you don't do what I tell you to do, then I will throw a mountain on top of you and you will all get buried over there. Of which afterwards the Talmud continues and says, Moda it is a strong objection that Jews are being basically forced into it because that's also not the covenant. And therefore, the only way how we know that we are obligated is by way of the Purim story. Because in the Purim story, Kiblu, it says over there that the Jews out of their own free will after the divine intervention had already stopped after the destruction of the temple, there was now an opportunity for the Jews to do this out of their own free will. So there is something in what Rabbi Greenberg says, and that is the very fact that after all, the issue of freedom of will does play a role to have a kind of a covenant which is justified. One must choose. choose. True is that today we obviously all choose because we are no longer forced by a mil military power or anybody like that of uh, having to keep the commandments. You and I keep the commandments because we decided so or because our parents have educated us like that. But it is a point to be made. So he speaks about what he calls a voluntary covenant and no longer an obligated covenant and acceptance. When you look in the whole literature, and there's no time here to go through all of it because there is so much about this by now. Interestingly enough, straight away after the Holocaust, nearly nobody wrote about the theological problems of the Holocaust. Nobody dared. Now, many years later, there are quite a few people who write about it. But when you read through all the different opinions, Zionist, not Zionist, and so on, you see indeed not only a contradiction, but you realize one thing, and that is the fact that it stays unexplainable. It is something which is beyond us. And the moment we are going to try very hard to explain God in our terms of what happened in the Holocaust, 
Yeshayahu Leibowitz, one of the great most radical thinkers in, in Israel, uh, but an Orthodox Jew, uh, wrote about that this is a form of Avodah Zarah. This is a form for idol worship. If I want to put God into the very, uh, let's say, uh, limits of my thinking, and I want to say what he should have done and what he should not have done, Leibowitz was of the opinion that all that is a form of idol worship. I suppose you all know that Leibowitz was of the opinion the only thing what counts in the Jewish tradition is the halacha, and that is what you have to do, and don't ask any questions, because the questions are basically unanswerable, but this is what we are being told. Now, I want to add something to Leibowitz, not that Leibowitz would agree with me on this point, but it's important to mention. I've written about this as well. I don't know if anybody else has ever mentioned this. I always say to my students, there's one very big problem in the Torah, and that is that the first pasuk in the Torah is missing. The very first pasuk, which should have been there, is missing. The Torah starts with the second pasuk. It starts with Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashamayim et Aretz. God created heaven and earth at the very beginning. But there is one huge question which every philosopher has to ask, and that is this, why? Why did God decide to create the universe? Why did he decide to create the human being? Why did he create all these millions of stars out there? What is the reason behind it? What is his purpose? Why did he start this a long time ago? And we are now caught into this by way of the fact that we are human beings living in this world. The Torah does not give any answer on this. And really, this very fact is the most profound question which we need to ask. What is the meaning of existence? What is the meaning of human existence? Why do we have all these things with the ups and downs, the evil and the good? If God would not have created the universe and he would not have created the earth, what would have been? A perfect world. Only the world would not exist. But things would have been much, much better that way than what we have now, where there is so much evil in this world till this very day that he could better, he would have better of the, done if he would not have created it. Problem here is that the Torah does not give any response to that. And that's what I mean when I say it is the second pasuk which the Torah starts with. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim et ha'aretz. The first pasuk is not there. Why not? Because no human being is ever able to get an answer to that question. Because any answer we give is always the human perspective on it. And Leibowitz would say, if you use your human perspective, then you're already busy with Abu Dazara. He even goes so far, if I understand him properly, that he says that the way in which the Torah expresses itself right through the five chumashim is also a form of Abu Dazara because it is putting God in front of us in the text in human terminology. The moment you make use of human terminology, you already have lost God because God cannot be described in any way, neither his thoughts can be described in any way which is even close to any human language. By the way, you find this concept very clearly in the Kabbalistic tradition, but we have no time to go into this now. But it is the very, let's say, denial, or better, the unanswerable question of why the world exists, which lays at the very foundation of all philosophical inquiry. And it is the only question which cannot really be asked and definitely not be answered. You can ask it, but there is no answer to be given because for that you have to step outside your mind and ask the question from the perspective of God, which you cannot do. That's not apologetics. That's not something to easily get out of the problem. No, this is the huge and absolute problem which all of us philosophers or not philosophers rabbis or whatever it is are confronted with this is by the way what rabbi Soloveitchik did 
Robert Soloveitchik also writes about the Holocaust, but it's very interesting. He never asks the question, why? He only asks one question, what do we do with it? And that's a very different question. Robert Soloveitchik says, you can't ask the question because there is no answer ever to be given within human terminology. So what does Robert Soloveitchik do? He does something very interesting. He speaks about goral, which means fate, and he speaks about yeut, destiny. The question which we need to ask, in according to his opinion, is one. What is the destiny of the Jewish people? What is the fate, if you want to say, but obviously that's a secular concept of the Jewish people, but that's the only kind of question which we can deal with. And so he answers very interestingly. He says, the only answer is that we have to continue to be Jews. We have to continue to live in according to the Torah. And that is what there is. There is nothing more because anything beyond that is beyond us. Emil Fackenheim, perhaps you've heard that name, a very famous professor. In the last years, he lived in Jerusalem and taught at the Hebrew University. I knew him personally, who became over the years a little bit more religious, um, speaks about something else, which I find disturbing, although I understand from where he comes. He says, after the Holocaust, you are not allowed to give up on your Jewishness and also not on the Jewish tradition. Why? Because that would give an author victory to Hitler in Marshall. Because that's what Hitler wanted. He wanted to make an end to the Jewish tradition. He wanted Jews to give up on the Jewish tradition. And therefore, Fackenheim introduces a concept. I find it a little cheap, but I understand again from where he comes. He speaks about the 614th commandment. He says there are not 613 tariyak mitzvot, but there are now 614 because the last one is don't give in to what Hitler wanted to basically achieve. And if you assimilate, and if you don't want to be part anymore of the Jewish people, then you help Hitler to still become the one who is victorious in this particular terrible moment in Jewish history. So he comes from a more emotional point of view, if that's the right word, by saying you cannot do anything else but live a religious life because there is now another commandment which tells you don't give in to Hitler's ideas. Why do I find it a little cheap? I find it a little cheap for one reason, and that is that there is no 614 commandment. There is no such thing that we can just like that create commandments, also I appreciate what he says. And it doesn't answer the question of why did it happen? There is one community, interestingly enough, who went along with Rabbi Soloveitchik. Very few people seem to be aware of this. And that are the Haredim. Because if you ask the Haredi community in Israel, and I suppose also in Gutslaritz, they will never ask the question, why did the Holocaust happen? They will also ask the question, what do we do now? How are we continuing our lives? And what the answer is, exactly what Rabbi Soloveitchik said. We will continue to live a full Jewish life. We will live in according to the Torah, to the Tariq Mitzvot and all the Halakha, because that way, not only that we by that defeat Hitler's philosophy, if you want to call it by that name, but because it is the only way which we can actually achieve and that is by way of living a Jewish life is all its values its beauty we don't ask the question why we only ask the question what now I think there are very few people who are actually aware that the Haredim live in according to that philosophy if you ask them and I've done this many times why did it happen they will say I don't know but it's not really important because it is beyond me but what is important is that I live a full Jewish life by way of the halacha and by way of the Tariq mitzvot. All comes back to the first pasuk, which is missing. 
because the first pasuk, which is missing, should have told us what the reason is why God created the world, and it doesn't. The humanity, in other words, only starts to come about after the fact is being stated that God has created the universe. Now we enter into history. We never entered before. Why? Because there is no response to this particular question, which I personally think, forgive me, is a profound observation which is not enough discussed. Why the first pasuk happens to be missing. So do we have an answer to the Holocaust? No, there is no answer to the Holocaust. And again, once more, this is not apologetics, but it is something which has to do with the fact that we as human beings are limited compared to God, that we should not even think in terms of godly thoughts, because how can we do that? We will have to step out of our own mind and our own brain to be able to do that. And that is completely impossible. So we therefore have to leave it with the question. But now comes up a very interesting observation made by a very good friend of mine. I suppose you have heard about him, perhaps. Professor Yehuda Gelman. Professor Yehuda Gelman uh, was a, he's retired by now, but he was a uh, very famous uh, philosopher. And uh, he wrote later after he got retired, he started to write a lot about specifically Jewish history and Jewish philosophy. Here this, I found this very, very interesting. It doesn't answer any of my questions concerning why, but it does give me a good insight by way of a, some kind of a midrashic interpretation of what the Holocaust is teaching us. How does he do that? He does that in the following way. He says, take a computer chip, that very little small thing in our computers, and take the uh, very um, image which we see on the computer screen. What is the relationship between these two? So he says there is a relationship. Why? Because the moment we change the chip, we get another screen. But what is so interesting is that when we look into the chip, we won't find any images there, which you later will see on the screen. The only thing what we know is that this chip causes the screen, the images on the screen. But even when I take the most fantastic and uh, large um, microscope and I put it on the chip to see what's going on in the chip, I will not see anything which the screen shows me. That's very interesting, because what that means is that there is a relationship between the two, which is completely unexplainable from the perspective of human beings. We found it, we discovered it, we didn't make it. We put it into the screen and we put it into the chip. And if I ask myself the question, how is the chip able to create the screen, the images on the screen, then the answer is, I don't know. So perhaps it is not true. No, it is true. Why? Because if I do something to the chip, it will show a different image on the screen. But the relationship between these two is completely impossible to understand. Says Professor Gelman, that's the case with the Holocaust as well, and with evil, and with also, also things. God does something, he is the chip. He is the computer chip. I can look into his brain and I won't find anything which in any form or way is human or to be understood by human beings. But when I look to the screen, I see the outcome. The outcome is that I now have an image, an image which I understand in, this, in the chip, I can't see anything at all and I do not understand anything at all. But on the screen, I do. Says Professor Gelman, this is why you have to understand that indeed, just like in the case of the screen and the chip, we do not understand what's going on, and we probably will never understand. So it is also true in the relationship between God and the Holocaust. If you do not understand that, he says, 
then you're missing the point of what the Torah is trying to make. It is again to go back to my example of the of the pasuk, the first pasuk. The first pasuk is mid, missing. That is to say, the relationship between the chip and the screen is missing, but it is there. The only thing is, I can't find it. It is not there in human terms. It is there in godly terms. And that is how we should relate to the Holocaust. Relation to relating to the Holocaust means to say, we are looking into a screen, see the most terrible things. They are somewhere related to God in the chip. And for the rest, we have to be quiet. And that, I think, is the reason why Rabbi Sola Weizsik and Hassan also said, don't ask the question why. There is no answer. Instead, as some people do, are trying to play God by saying to us, you have to keep the commandments, you have to do this and that, and then it won't happen. And if you do not do what the commandments tell you to do, then it will be disaster. That doesn't work. Now I come back for a moment to my professor, my friend, the professor of physics. And I told him this afterwards. There is a Chazon Ish, the famous Yeshayahu Karlitz, who lived in Bnei Barak several years ago. Tremendous thinker, tremendous halachist, and really part of the Haredi community. In Yoredea, if you want to look it up, in Hil Shita, chapter 2, observation 16, the Chazonish discusses the question, why in the days of the Torah there were punishments, which were terrible harsh, when you would violate the Shabbat, when you would violate other things, people would uh, get a death penalty and other forms, and there were there are some quite a few cruel matters here in the Halakha. And then he writes, but we know that the sages a long time ago did away with them. There are no such, let's say, uh, terrible punishments anymore says the Chazonish like this, is very interesting. He doesn't discuss the Holocaust per se, but he says like this, you have to realize, when these, did these punishments actually still work? How long ago was it that this still happened? That when a person did something wrong, like uh, violating the Shabbat, he was terribly punished, or by the court, or by God himself, whatever it may be. Says the Chasonish like this, and I will read you because it is important to hear his words. He says, such laws only applied at times when the divine presence, God presence, was clearly revealed, such as in the days when there were open miracles and a heavenly voice was heard, and when the righteous would op operate under direct divine intervention, when God's shina was still, gilu shina as we call it, was still openly there, you could see God's hand every moment. Then there was an absolute need to observe all the commandments, because you would straight away see the result. You were living in days where divine, the divine presence will, was openly revealed, and therefore there was no way how you could deny God's existence or his intervention in history or in Jewish history. But then he consider, continues and he says, in such days there was the need to remove this kind of wickedness, yeah, like Gil, Shabbat, or other forms, from the world, since everybody knew that it would bring divine retribution on the world, including drought, pestilence, and famine. But at the time of divine hiding, speaking about Purim, in which faith, Emona, has become weak in people, we don't see the open hand anymore of God working within our history. There is no purpose in taking such action, harsh measurements against heretics and violators. In fact, it has the reverse effect. If we now would punish these people the way as the Torah describes, it would have the opposite effect, and it would only create more people violating the Torah because they would believe that it cannot be the word of God. And therefore, we have an obligation to try to bring them back with courts of love. All those people who are violating the Torah, 
you have to give, bring, bring them back to the Torah by way of love, not by way of punishments, says the Chazonish. Quite interesting for a Haredi thinker to make this particular observation. But I think in many ways that is true. So if my professor, my friend is saying, it all happened because you can read it in the Torah uh, where all the klalot are being described, then the answer by the Chazonish is, you can't compare the two cases. One is a case where the Shina was still openly with us, and you could not deny God's existence. You could not deny that the Torah was min hashamayim from heaven. But now today, with all the other things which have basically done away with this emuna, or Bible criticism, or whatever you want to speak about, or Spinoza's critique on the, on the, the Jewish tradition, then to still continue to say that the different curses in the Torah are meant for us today, says the Chazonish, that is a complete impossibility. In fact, it is extremely dangerous because it will bring people to do fanatic things which have got nothing to do with the Jewish tradition. And I think that this is a very important point made by the Chazonish, very worthwhile looking up. And uh, in that way, our end conclusion is basically this. It's very interesting Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, in one of his in, in his uh, work in his Pirush on the on the Haggadah, makes the following point: We know that there were four sons, which we read about in the Haggadah. Three of them are openly shown in the in Sefer Shemot. Three of them. The wicked one, the Tom, and the Enu Yodea. There's one which only appears in the Torah in Sefer Dubarim. That's 40 years later. Says Rabbi Sachs, that not for nothing. The Chacham can only ask a question if he has thought about it for 40 years. The wicked one straight away asks the question. The Enu Yodea are least all, and the Tom, okay, they don't even ask properly. But the Chacham, the wise man, is aware it may take still hundreds of years till we get some more insight into these kinds of questions. And therefore the Torah says it was only after the 40 years in the desert that this question was revealed in the Torah. I think that is very, very interesting, a very important observation to make. We cannot answer. Whether we ever will answer the Holocaust, I doubt it. But why should we should always remember what Professor Gelman says, what Rabbi Sol Weitzig says, and we have to be humble enough to say, okay, that's what there is. We continue to live our Jewish lives because we know there is much above the sun, and there are many things which we will never understand. And as long as we are aware of that, they were humble enough, we can deal even with the Holocaust. There is much more to be said about it, but I will stop it here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Cardozo. Uh, we would love to open it up um, to everyone on the call for any questions or comments. Feel free to raise your hand and then uh, you can unmute and ask a question or write something in the chat. Hi, Rabbi Khaitovsky. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Cardozo. Um, could you possibly share the, uh, the location or the link I'm not sure how you would do it for where the Chazon Ish um, wrote what he wrote. And I know that you had an article about that, um, uh, one of your essays. I, I, I do know that. Um, I don't have that handy, but I think that would be um, great for us to be able to see it. it. It is shocking in our own mind to hear that the Chazon Ish said something like that. And um, if you could talk a little bit more about some of the things that you resonate to with Rabbi Yitz Greenberg's um, post-Holocaust uh, theology, what, what you found interesting and what some of the issues you had might be. Yes, uh, this is a difficult question to respond to. Uh, again, I don't know if Rabbi Yitz is still of this opinion. Uh, as I said, I heard that he is not. I don't know why. 
what I find interesting about this approach is that it is uh, when man decides on his own to keep the commandments and not because he's obligated, that is really a higher level of religious life. Because as long as I'm forced into it, and as long as it becomes only a commandment, and it is not a choice which I make, a very conscious choice, then there is something, in my opinion, missing. Because it is, after all, a form of force. Na sebe nishma. The, the, the real issue is here, how do I really live my religious life? And I have somewhere, I feel somewhere that the best way to live your religious life is when you get to use Heschel's expression, Abraham Joshua Heschel's expression, when you get so overwhelmed by the amazement, what he calls radical amazement, that you then want to be part of this worldview not because you're obligated, not because it is a mitzaveve ose, as we say in Hebrew, but it is because mitzaveve eno, uh, sorry, eno mitzaveve ose. It is because I was not obligated and I still took that onto myself. I've compared that once to Yitro, the father in law of Moshe Rabbeinu. This man didn't have to keep the commandments, but he decided to keep the commandments after he had heard what had taken place, which means to say he lived in some kind of amazement about the splitting of the Red Sea, whatever it was, and he decided, and that's also what happens in the Purim story. Therefore, I like the attitude of Rabbi uh, Kinberg. My problem with it is that it goes right against the traditional way of looking to this. I cannot deny that. But perhaps it is so, and there are some sources for that, perhaps in the Midrash as well, is that there will be a day when we have moved so much forward in our religiosity that it is better to do it out of your own free will and not because your grandparents said, Na Sevenishma, thousands of years ago. I, I can see that point. Thank you. Um, I see a, a question from Arlene in the chat. If the, call, if the Holocaust happened due to lack of observance of the Torah, how was the message of what should be learned from the Holocaust conveyed to the Jewish people following the Holocaust? Absolutely nothing. The reverse. If we are going to make that kind of point of view, then most Jews will altogether walk out because they will say, if God did that to me or to us, then I don't want to have anything to do with him. And therefore, this argument cannot be used. If one million children get killed and murdered in the most terrible way, and then to say afterwards that God did that, who wants to have anything to do with this God? And I think that's a profound point. Thank you. Uh, hi, Susanna. Um, if I understood you correctly, you said that the, um, I think you said that the Haredim or the, the Satmar um, did said the opposite of uh, what the, the previous question just said that you know that this was not a punishment but I, I mean I me remember reading in somebody's memoir um, I don't remember which community he came from um, exactly said that his community that he left um, felt that in fact that's why that that was the reason for the Holocaust and that's why the, the Haredim are more, you know, much more um, radical and, you know, and right wing in their religiosity than they were before because they're trying to make up for, you know, the, by, by becoming, you know, extra religious, so to speak, um, is how they're, 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 they're making up for this to, to win back God's favor, so to speak. In what way would they make up? To defend God? No, no, to... Um, so that, if, in other words, we did bad. That's why this happened to us. So we have to be extra good. So ah. extra good in quotation marks. <laughs> that, that could be. But if you speak to the more intellectual Haredim, they will not use that argument. I, I, I'm discussing that. They will say, we don't know. But the only thing what we know is that our destiny is to continue to live a Jewish life. Whether or not I understand the Holocaust is to them of little importance because they actually make the point. We will never understand. But the, 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 the general Haredi may not be sophisticated to un even understand this argument. Yeah, that's very possible. Thank you. Pleasure. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Rabbi Cardozo, for joining us today. It was a real pleasure to learn with you. And thank you all for being here as well. Uh, just a reminder that next week, we have two great programs coming up on Wednesday. We have Esther, the graphic novel, How the Original Wonder Woman Took Flight at 1 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time with Jordan B. Gorfinkel, and then in person or virtual, Dara Horn on Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Mountain Time um, for Agreeable Jews, Dead Jews, and the Challenge of Diversity, where she will talk more about her uh, New York Times bestselling book. So we hope that you can join us for that as well. And thank you all again. Have a great day. <laughs>